Okay. okay. Um, all right. So, so what is it that, um, that we can discuss uh, that, that derives from these essays and this issue? So the first thing we might do is we could ask, is the scaffold edges distinction generally useful? for what constitutes a vision and for identifying types of differences among advocates of vision and for how we talk about vision. So the, my claim would be that it is, that it's a, it's a good way of thinking about vision for purposes of uh, talking about it, communicating it, avoiding confusions, et cetera, et cetera. A possible refutation would be, um, it's too muddy. It doesn't give a sufficient feeling for what it would be like to live within the system, uh, just providing the, uh, the scaffold is insufficient, the critic might say, and providing the rest, but constantly um, qualifying that it's only uh, uh, edge features, contingent features, would make it feel too muddy, critic might say. Next, we could ask, we're going to come back and do all these. Next, we could ask, is the specific identification of the participatory economic scaffold. And the examples of edges for participatory economics that I give in the essay is convincing. So the claim would be, yes, these five feature, features are the essence of the necessary elements of this thing that we are calling participatory planning. They're all necessary and other possibilities are not. And the possible refutation I guess it could have two dimensions. One could be, wait, the five aren't all that's necessary. Here's another one. Here's another one. There are, there are other things that are essential and that should be part of the core definition of this vision called participatory economics. And um, I suppose the other, the other refutation would be to say that uh, some of the features that are listed aren't essential. Uh, they aren't necessary. They don't need to be a part in the scaffold. Okay, so a third thing that we can discuss, and there's only four things that I'm going to try and have us go over. Um, we could ask, how can we most usefully deal with differences about vision? So in this particular part of the, of the session, the idea would be that when you're talking about visions or contending visions, and you arrive at differences, it would be very useful, that's the claim, to determine whether or not these differences are differences over uh, um, scaffold features, essential features, or their differences over contingent features, because how one approaches such differences are different. And perhaps most provocatively, fourth, we could ask, and this doesn't come from the essays, I think, except by extrapolation, we could ask, is there a version of this whole set of thoughts that is more widely relevant not just for vision, but for strategy, for analysis, for a whole host of possible things about which people uh, could be debating and discussing and could have differences. And the claim is that yes, it would be, and the, obviously the refutation would be to show that in such cases it's irrelevant. Um, so, okay, I could talk about these four topics um, uh, going on for the whole time, but I don't wanna do that. So. I'm going to um, suggest something, and then I'm going to ask for reactions. Um, uh, in particular, differences from what I'm suggesting as a claim. Um, and you might hold those differences and bring them up because they represent your view, or you might bring them up just because you want to explore that difference, uh, sort of like uh, um, a, a devil's advocate, except it's more like a dissenter's advocate. OK, so first, I believe the scaffold edges distinction is useful for thinking about what constitutes vision for any domain and for identifying and exploring types of differences among advocates of vision for any domain and for how we talk about vision so either because you disagree or just because you want to bring something up that's worth exploring does someone dissent from that or are we going to already accept that claim anyone somebody want to dissent from that uh no. No one wants to dissent. Okay, now now's when the trouble starts. Now it's going to be like TV, the law school where the annoying faculty calls on you, even though nobody has their hand up. But Lonnie is rescuing everybody else. Go ahead, Lonnie. 
Yeah, so um, actually, actually, I do believe that the scaffold uh, uh, concept is a good idea, but I actually think that what might be helpful, and we can discuss this in other questions as well, is the idea that it may not be just a scaffold for the institutions. Um, it may be a scaffold. I don't know if you would say that, but, but maybe uh, okay. part of this could be applied to the values as well to where, so let's say that uh, somebody else comes along with another you know, institution that uh, they believe they can prove uh, is in line with the core values that we have, right? And that fits those values. Um, I think that that may be just as important as the initial scaffold for the institutions that we've uh, that we're talking about with participatory economics. And so I don't know if you would consider that a scaffold for the values, but um, I think that that those core values, if that's what we're trying to keep within, may be just as important, if not in the long run, more important. Uh, than this particular set of institutions within the scaffold. Okay, so the, the, the point here is, I think, correct me if I got this wrong, Lonnie, um, the institutions aren't, we don't value them just because they have nice names. We, we must be valuing them for the reason that they fulfill and implement values that we hold dear, agreed. And that's the way, um, so I should have said institutional vision. Um, and then that would have been clearer, but I think it's very good that you brought that up because otherwise it's floating in space, so to speak. Okay, so that, so we get past that. And um, second, what about the specific identification of the five features identified as the scaffold of participatory economics? And uh, the edges that I um, described in the articles, are those uh um valid and useful does anyone again just for purposes of thinking it through or because you really do disagree think that there should be additional aspects in the scaffold or that one or more of the five aspects listed should be removed it's not necessary okay i'll bet one of you even knows who i'm going to call on if Nobody else gets their hand up. Oh, Travis, go ahead. I remember Peter uh, Bomer, who's on the call as well, mentioned there's a couple other features that we could add, like um, adding... <laughs> That's who I was going to call on. <laughs> oh, okay. That's okay, go ahead. Well, he, well, he can explain it better than me, but like um, you know, equality, like gender, um, sex, you know, all that stuff. And in the economy, it's up. Okay, but that's for the whole society. I, I want to be clear that I'm going to talk about the economy. Of course, you want the economy to respect um, anti-racism, to respect feminism, and so on. But I don't want to talk about that yet. I just want to talk about the institutional features of participatory economy. We know, I think, most of us, or all of us, that the values behind them our equity and self-management, diversity, um, uh, solidarity, sustainability, and internationalism. Okay, so so what we're saying is the thing that you're that that somebody is going to question in a minute is: Have we described sufficiently and with necessity that vision? If we say the five things, the five features, the five institutional features, right? a productive commons, uh, self-managing councils for production and consumption, balanced job complexes, equitable remuneration and participatory planning. All right. So that's I not the some... whole, that's not the whole of participatory, of a participatory economic society, which is going to include thousands of other things, right? It's our, have we got the heart of it, right? If somebody asks what's capitalism and what's the heart of it, you don't list everything that you find in the United States. You list the essential defining elements of capitalism. Okay, so let's go to uh, Peter. 
um, what feature might you want to remove or what feature might you want to add and therefore change this basic description of participatory economics? It doesn't have to be something you believe, just something. <laughs> your, your sound's off, Peter. So it's probably something I believe, okay? Okay. So let me start. Yesterday, I was inviting somebody. No, a few days ago, I was talking to somebody. I also talked to you yesterday about a book called Overcoming Capitalism by Tom Wetzel. And I said, I think the book is very kind of class reductionist, even though it has a bureaucratic class, but it doesn't really deal with race in any sinful way or gender. Then he said he agreed with that. But the book was trying to focus on the economy. He said it's very similar to the no bosses. I think a book you know, Michael, right? And so I guess following what Travis said, I guess the question is what's central? And it's a danger that I think you're doing of really separating the economy too much. For example, to me, the issue of, of racial equality or racial liberation, that's very much an economic issue too. And I think by your saying, I'm just going to deal with the economy there are problems with that, of really making everything else secondary. I know that's not your politics, but I think it comes out that. So I would see issues like some of these are part of the institutional scaffolding also, including some of the global stuff too. Because I, I guess I think what's going to appeal to people about a world that's really different from this one. And I, and I feel there's just too much separation of the economy from everything else and what you're doing. And it's tied to the scaffolding specifically. And if, when I was talking about participatory economics, I was talking about the alternative society that we desire, I would agree with you a thousand percent. I know. Okay. But if when we're talking about that, so for instance, suppose somebody was talking about um, kinship vision, right? I don't think most of us would expect that person to talk about workers' self-management in production. But the reality is that that's analogous for me, right? We can disagree about that. You know, that's analogous for me to what you're saying. Uh, there's no place that participatory economics, at least as I present it, doesn't say that the economy has to accommodate to and respect the gains and the changes that arise around race, gender, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but there's a different way of answering this, which I find annoying in the way that you're finding the whole thing annoying, which is somebody could say, well, look, equitable remuneration eliminates um, racial disparities. If everybody gets income for, and this is how some Marxist who supports participatory economics might talk about it, uh, equitable remuneration eliminates that. Balanced job complexes eliminates finding women or, or any other constituency in st systematically support, subordinate positions. It just rules it out. It doesn't exist, right? And they would then they might then claim, therefore, participatory economics solves these other problems, and we don't have to talk about these other problems. Now, I don't believe that for a minute, right? But I do believe there's something to be said for not simultaneously trying to solve all problems without admitting that economics doesn't solve those problems. Fundamental changes in those domains are necessary to solve those problems, but economy needs to be consistent with that and needs, and needs to abet that and support that. So for purpose, and, I, and we could agree to, you know, I'm not saying you should be convinced of that. I'm just saying for purposes of this presentation, I want to hone in on the economic institutions and at least for a minute until we get further along, not their differential effects on women and men or blacks and whites, um, but their basic economic characteristics. And I would have thought you might have said, for instance, well, a minimum income. What do you call it? A guarantee? What is what do you call it? Universal, universal basic income. UBI. Yeah, universal basic income. So somebody might say a universal basic income is an essential uh, feature of the kind of economy we want. And therefore, there would be six features now, they would say. Or they might say no poverty. 
right, right, is an essential feature of the kind of economy that we want. That would make a seventh feature. Or uh, somebody might say that one of the, well, somebody might say we don't need balanced job complexes. If we have everything else, we're not going to have any problem on that score because income is equitable and, because, and so on. And um, what can I tell you? Um, for me, the reason that we don't have something is because it's already quite implicit. And, you know, it's something that we want, no poverty. Well, we already have no poverty because we have equitable remuneration and full income for somebody who doesn't work or can't work. So that takes care of that. It gives people more income than a universal basic income. Or we don't, what was the other one? The other one was... Um, Decommodification of all basic goods. Decommodification okay. of all and services. Okay. So, um, regrettably, we'd have to spend a certain amount of time figuring out what we mean by the word decommodification or commodification. But presumably, we mean something like the thing that we're talking about is treated as a commodity um, and it's distributed as a commodity um, that has a, a price and that people get that way. And my answer to that would be, well, certain things are free, um, um, like, you know, healthcare and so on. So, so yes, certain things are free. So they're decommodified pretty much whatever we mean by the word commodity. Um, and one might go on to say, well, so should housing be free. So should food be free. So should after all, and, and one could go even further, and so should pianos be free, because they are basic to what it means to be a human if you like to play the piano, you know. And the answer to that, I think, is, I don't think that's the case. Um, we're not going to resolve any of these things quickly in a group like this, I don't think. But I don't think that should be the case, because I think, uh, you know, there are different instances of each thing. You you. You don't just need the thing like you need penicillin, right? You desire the thing and you may desire lots more of it and or less of it. And um, how society allots uh, its resources to produce those things should depend, in fact, on how much people want them, on the extent to which people are, are, are which is evidenced by the fact that you're willing to spend more or less and so on. So anyway, what we can see, I don't want to spend too long on this because I want to get to the fourth thing, which is where I think the maybe more relevant and outside the box elements come in. But anyway, you can see how somebody could 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 address an economic vision or a, a political vision, Steve's here, and say a, a component of that is really not necessary or this additional component is necessary, right? Um, uh, yeah, we have more hand. Alexandria? Travis, did you have your hand up before me? I, I can't really see him on my phone. Yeah, yes, I'm going to call I, on him I, next. He already spoke. So you're. Oh, sorry. Person. Okay. I'm, I'm talking blind here into my phone. Hi, everybody. Okay. Um, I was just going to add that for me, at least, the, the two most common, um, not exactly pushbacks, but like digging into this, are the, the five features enough or are they too much? Um, the two that I often hear is that, okay, you have a value of sustainability, but I don't really see an institution that specifically deals with that. Um, you have, uh, you know, participatory planning and self-managed councils. So in theory, people able to make their own decisions can consider the environment, but there's nothing that forces them to. Um, and the second one is that I often hear is people will say, well, couldn't we just not have money or, you know, not have planning? And you've dealt with this a little in your, your comments just now on decommodification. And I also think, you know, participatory planning kind of answers this um, if we question what is money for in the first place um, as, you know, an indicator of how much we can produce and consume. Um, so I, I don't personally hold those two beliefs myself. Maybe I think a little more could be done to address the first one. Um, but I, I just felt they were worth bringing up because those are the two most common things I hear when presenting the five features. Okay, so let's think about 
both of them for a second. So the sustainability one, first, I should admit something. When Robin and I were first developing this thing, um, uh, ecology wasn't as powerfully in people's minds, including ourselves. And uh, the truth of the matter is that we didn't list sustainability and we didn't think about it. And when we got all finished, so to speak, you know, finished at that point in time, uh, we had participatory planning and we got nervous that we had created a mess because we hadn't taken into account self-consciously and clearly sustainability. But then we decided that, well, wait a minute, we did deal with it. And, and here, what I'm, what I'm suggesting is, see, sustainability isn't all that different in this regard than, say, overcoming racism. The, the economic part of sustainability is indeed participatory planning, which properly prices uh, effects on the environment and then properly deliberates about what one wants and what doesn't want, one doesn't want. And that's the economic component of dealing with sustainability. But that not, that's not the whole of it necessarily. And it's certainly not the whole of dealing with ecology. So for instance, the economy can't decide that we're not going to kill owls because we like owls. Maybe people like to eat owls, and, but we also want to preserve them forever. So there might be ecological institutions, just like there might be institutions in the family or in community dealing with race or dealing with gender. There, there might need to be a set of institutions that are fundamentally ecological. They're going to still have economic aspects, just like the family has economic aspects. Look, everything is everything. But in any event, my point is, you're right, Alexandria, that, that the, the link between uh, the economic institutions and ecological sustainability sort of appears less precise. But actually, if you think about the others, it's true too. You know, in other words, um, having uh, uh, income for duration, intensity, and onerousness, and saying that's what you're going to do in the workplaces, doesn't work unless you also have an allocation system that's consistent with that. It doesn't work if you also have classes. You'll be saying you're doing that, but you won't be doing that because classes will be dominating. So, it's a half a bridge never solves a problem and almost everything when talking about society is partial. Um, and it's, so I hope that that works. In any case, I do think that uh, dealing with sustainability, one of those values in what Lonnie opened up with is true in these five essential features. Money, which was the other one you mentioned, and I do think that that arises for people. I suppose it's it's like what Peter said about commodification. You know, it's this feeling that money is dirty, that somehow money doesn't talk, it swears. <laughs> That's Bob Dylan. Um, uh, and and it's true. In our system, money doesn't talk, it swears. Money is intrinsically uh, embodies uh, capital, it embodies earning based on holding. And it also just because the allocation system is about power, money is manifest power. But in a participatory economy, that isn't true. It's just an indicator of how much one wants something, or how much it uses to produce something that we value, and we want to track. Now, this is, you know, all of these things can be explored in great detail, but um, let me just say one more thing about that. So um, an anarchist who doesn't like money might gravitate to, from each according to their ability to each according to their need, as a norm to guide allocation. So in other words, we take what we need and we give what we feel we can provide. And the problem with that is, is that nobody is ever assessing the value of anything. And so no decision is being made in a manner which is taking account of the values associated with producing and consuming stuff, neither the ecological values, nor the interpersonal personal values, nor the collective social values. And so it's not money that's important. 
It's values. It's pricing things. It's, it's having some sort of congealed estimate of the way people value stuff. Okay, that's what's important. And it's not perfect. Here's one of the disagreements um, that could exist. Um, another one. So somebody might say um, uh, the incorporation of qualitative information in participatory planning is particularly important. Somebody else might say the incorporation of qualitative information in participatory planning will, will cause us to spend too long planning, time matters, and it will be counterproductive, right? So, and the first person who said it might say it as a hedge against, a guard against mispricing, right? In other words, if you, if you put all your eggs in the number that's attached to a, a, a product and you put no attention to a sort of a qualitative assessment and the exchange of some qualitative information, you might get stuck with a wrong number because you haven't assessed it. I hope that's clear. I mean, it might not be. We're getting into the innards now, I suppose. Um, but, you, but this is the kind of difference that can arise. And I think that's an edge difference. Even though it's important, an edge difference is not unimportant, right? It's just that it isn't the defining feature, right? There, it, it, you, could, you can debate it and, you, and it's contingent. You can imagine two participatory economies. One does something one way, one does something another way. They're still both participatory economies. Just like you can imagine capitalism in Sweden, capitalism in the United States, there's still capitalism. What is it that makes the thing still what you're talking about, capitalism or participatory economics? That's what the, the scaffold is supposed to identify. Right. Um, somebody, Travis, is your hand back up? Wait a minute. Ian, go ahead. I'll come back to you, Travis. Ian? Yep. Okay. I'm just unmuting here. Yeah. Uh, thanks. I, um, I'm glad that Alexandria brought up that, that uh, sustainability institution question because that's, that's something I've kind of wrestled with too a little bit from uh, uh, trying to, you know, taking the course with Michael and the Mill Bosses course. And it, it, it does very much feel like this, this edge that uh, we are um, expecting, like, like yeah, the, the, the same sort of analogy to, to racism and sexism being uh, answered by say, economics. Um, I, I guess I see it as, as how, how, do you, how do you get that qualitative information? It's a, it's a question of how how these future societies are going to get that qualitative information to consumers. If you consider sort of the market system uh, as sort of a null where it's just sort of buyer and seller, no other information. And then if you have decisions being influenced by that information from the, you know, the environmental impact um, that's driving the decision that, that I guess that's something we can't really foresee because even, uh, you know, 30, 40 years ago, we didn't have something like the internet to even foresee as, as being as influential in, in somebody's ability to access this information, to make uh, purchasing decisions and how it might affect uh, their communities, how it might affect their environment. Um, but that, that being said, it, it, it also calls into question sort of the, the values that we place on things like diversity or biodiversity just for the sake of having diversity. Um, and, and so we see this in society, or not society, in the sciences, in ecological sciences, um, it was assumed that just having a high diversity, so like a high number of species in, in a community was enough to be resilient to uh, perturbation, some disturbance or invasion of other species into that community. Uh, and they're finding out through, you know, lots of different experiments that that's not always the case. It's typically one or a few species that are highly influential in that community that are driving sort of this resilience. Um, and then so that's sort of now this shift to the paradigm to sort of this ecosystem services or what, what is really being generated by the diversity. So not just diversity for diversity's sake or biodiversity right. for diversity's sake, but you know, what is the function of having a diverse environment? And I, and I don't know if that's totally analogous to a sort of having a you know, communal uh, vision of, of this of diversity as a, 
and I and I understand also that, that as an economic point, we're not really considering outside of the human realm as something that's supposed to be as a you know the values that humans have, and it's supposed to be an institution for humans and their civilization. Sure. Uh, so it still has to function for human need. Um, but yeah, I guess I, I yeah I, I I guess so. That's where my my wavering led to. Like I I, I think I agree that doesn't. It doesn't need to be as discretized right now, right. and it is more of an edge. Mm -hmm. I guess the way I would answer, and it's not the way everyone who advocates participatory economics would answer, right? Well, let me clarify. The, the, the most succinct answer would be somebody would say, uh, participatory planning has the best procedures that we can incorporate into it for properly pricing external impact, ecological effects, ecological implications. And then the process of buyers and sellers, which is to say not buyers and sellers, but producers and consumers, right? Because um, they're not, not really doing that. Anyway, producers and consumers negotiating a plan and arriving at a plan will give us very good, not perfect, but very good treatment of those things. The next person might say, sounds good, but I don't fully trust it. And I want a mechanism of communication, not just of the prices, but of the reasons for the prices, so that the debate, and you're describing a changing and evolving situation, right? So that the debate is available, and so that people can see those changes and learn from them, et cetera. And I, I lean that way. Um, the, the human, non-human, I think the answer to that is, the honest answer is participatory planning does not protect the interests of animals, right? In, in other words, the planning process itself is never going to arrive at the position um, we should not kill spotted owls or whatever you want to talk about, right? But the political system does that. And so, it, you know, it's it, no single part of a society solves all problems. And but it has to be able to accommodate it. If it was the case that the political system decided, deciding that you can't kill spotted owls or you have to do this or whatever regarding the ecology would interfere with the operations of a participatory economy, that would be a serious flaw, right? So that's something to look at when we're evaluating. Just like it's a serious flaw, it would be a, a, a deadly flaw if... Uh, you know, the desire of the emerges from the kinship sphere to deal with gender and, and sexuality and so on couldn't be respected and implemented in the economy. That would just be deadly um, to the participatory economy. But participatory economy has no problem dealing with that kind of stuff. I, since we're supposed to be talking, I mean, I'd be happy to talk about this stuff forever, but since we're supposed to be talking about the edges scaffold thing, I want to push forward with that a little if it's okay. But first, um, well, Travis has been waiting forever, and, and then I'll get you, Erska. Go ahead, Travis. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I have a few things to say. Um, so one is with equitable remuneration, you know, I think it's partially problematic because I think it should be based on effort, sacrifice, and need. So for example, if That's you have an economy, I don't understand. That's what it is, right? Well, well, the way we describe it a lot is, you know, how long you work, how hard you work and the unpleasantness, but we don't put in the need as much. So oh, for oh, example, if, if you have an economy that isn't produced, a participatory economy, that's not producing much, um, you know, your first priority is satisfying everyone's needs equally. So you might literally not even get to effort and sacrifice. So I think that has to be on there. And that all would also appease the Marxists a bit who want to remunerate for need. Another thing I wanted to say was with the spheres. Um, I don't know if it's a, they're as demarcated as, peop, as we're assuming they are. So whenever you try to, you know, come up with a kinship vision, you basically inadvertently have to talk about when you're trying to come up with institutions, it's like you're talking about political institutions and economic institutions generally. Um, so no, I, I think- Why, why can't that, you be talking about the family, which is a kinship institution? 
you can be, but like if you're talking about um, how to actually institutionally prevent negative results, you're talking about like laws. So, you know, pop political things like that. And so what I would say is like, it, it almost makes so it, it almost makes more sense to say the spheres are something like politics, economics, and culture, where culture is, you know, you'd you'd think about things like um, information people receive. So, participatory planning probably does well, you know, in in uh, with uh, the institutions of news, and media, and things like that. But maybe there's extra institutions you have to add to make sure that people are you know getting the best information and freedom of speech is protecting all this the last thing i wanted to say was uh participatory planning could i could see like different edges with that with you know even the foundations of it so for example i read robin hanel's book a participatory economy and he talks about during the year after planning you have you have adjustments like all the time yeah, to course. a plan so I could see someone saying that you don't even need participatory planning where, you know, individuals are submitting proposals, et cetera. And, you know, maybe you do that one time and then indefinitely you can just update the plan and never have to do it again. Of course, you still have to deal with investment planning and long-term planning, um, you know, that's, but that's different already than the core participatory plan. That's not individuals submitting proposals, et cetera. Um, so in that case, you know, that economy, it's like, it wouldn't even really be planned. It wouldn't be markets because there's no private ownership of the means of production, et cetera. It's literally something else that we have to come up with a name for. If that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So wait, it was need, the spheres, and the planning, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So need... You know, there's two different ways, I think. I mean, there's probably lots of ways. I mean, all this stuff is, it, it, it's simple words, but it is rich issues, I think. So need, one way to talk about it is there's some sort of objective needs that people have. And, you know, they there's a pile of them and they go to here and they don't go any higher. You know, this is them, right? And whenever anybody is talking about filling basic needs, that's what it feels like people are talking about to me. The other way of talking about needs is what people need. That is what they say they want, right? Participatory planning and participatory economics are dealing with needs all the time, right? They're not ignoring needs. We're just saying that the fact that you need, that you say you want something, think of it that way instead of as the word need for a minute, that you say you want something doesn't mean you get it. It, it you know, there's only so much, there's different amounts, it has different inputs, et cetera, et cetera. And so you need an allocation system in order to cope with that. Then there are some things, however, now we get back to those basic needs um, that you shouldn't, it shouldn't come from your income, from your budget. It shouldn't be that I get less other stuff because I need penicillin, right? So I shouldn't have my claim on the social product reduced by the fact that I'm sick and I need penicillin, right? That's a way to think about it, I, I think. Um, and, but my, my access to other stuff should be reduced by my getting, you know, a bicycle or a bigger house or so on. So, the, if we were going to define basic need that way, it would be the things that you should get and that um, you don't get endless quantities of um, and that you shouldn't be charged for basically free goods. And participatory economics says that society will decide what the free goods are. Now, should we decide what they are? Well, we could talk about it but it doesn't matter if we decide what they are because our opinion is a, of no consequence. Future people are going to decide what is made free, right? We can hypothesize that they are going to decide that medicine should be free, that healthcare should be free, that, that basic education uh, or maybe all education should be free, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's interesting to talk about, but it's not our 
place, right? It's their place. It's our place, and this is behind the idea of, of uh, scaffold and edges. It's our place to establish a system which allows future people to self-manage all those countless choices that bear on their lives. And that's what we're trying to deliver for the economy with participatory economics and presumably for other domains with other systems. Okay, so that was the need thing. The second thing was, Travis, what was the second thing? Sorry. The spheres. Oh, so yeah. I would just say, and they're not a, you know. Yeah. There's um, not as clear differences between each sphere as I think sometimes we let on, you know? This First of all, in the initial formulation, there is no strict boundary between spheres. In fact, we talk about it, or I talk about it, as each sphere writ large is the whole society. The point is the sphere imp impacts everything else and is impacted by everything else. But you can't always... <laughs> Robin used to call it being a Zen, a Zen politician instead. You can't always take everything into account, right? It's impossible. You have to think taking, taking things that have more impact into account sometimes and less impact into account. A, another way of thinking about this is not going to appeal to everybody here, but you can, def, you can describe an economic system, I mean, a, a mathematical system by describing some basic axioms, some basic things at the base of that system. And you can do it more than one way. You, it's not true that there's only one way to do that, right? And so we can carve up society by having different entities, let's call them spheres if you want, Travis, right? Um, and by saying, if we understand those spheres and we understand them in the following way, they basically define society. So why these? Well, the answer to why these was to relate to what history shows us and society when we were doing this shows us is the inclination of people, right? Which is to say the inclination of people is to react to organize in response to develop movements around these these things right so at the time it was anti-capitalist movements it was anarchist movements it was anti-racist and civil rights movements and it was the women's movement right and so that led to the four spheres and that's that's you know that's the truth of it right um and uh Oh, there was a fourth. Oh, the the planning. Th well, that would take a little, would take a, maybe a little time. I think you're describing the same thing as participatory planning. You're just underestimating what it means to continually start again and arrive, or you're overestimating what it means to continually start again and arrive at a plan, as compared to taking a plan and making it accurate. The former is the best way to do the latter when we're talking about over a long haul. I, I hope that's clear. I don't want to spend too long on it, right? In other words, yeah, if you... and I think I think participatory planning is a good idea. I'm just saying someone could have a different opinion. I think oh, all right, maybe they, they have, could, but I think it would still could be a participatory economy, just a terribly inefficient one. That's all. All you right. Well, I mean? that. This is a good example now for the for the the second issue then, which is okay. So somebody comes along and says, eh, "Let's do participatory planning the way it's described in participatory economics in year one, and maybe in year two, right? And from then on, let's forget about that initial planning period, right? And instead, keep modifying the plan because there are changes, right?" And we say, do that during the course of the year. And this new person says, do that forever. That's what you're proposing, I think. And so the person proposes that. It's an edge difference if it's not fundamental, right? My, my quick reaction, I could be wrong. Maybe you're right. My quick reaction is it's not an edge difference. It would be a calamity. It would fail. And so it's a, 
you know, it's a possible feature. You're saying that, and it's true. It's a possible feature. I think it would fail. If it wouldn't fail, if it wouldn't not deliver the values, going back to Lonnie's point, that that's the heart of it, right? Then it would be an edge feature. If it would fail, it's a scaffold feature. We can't change that, that feature, right? <clears throat> a different version of that is how in the planning process, does the planning process, the back and forth of workers and consumers councils through the iterations, what do we augment that with to capture the ecological factors that Ian was talking about, even in the short run, much less over time as our understanding of the situation changes? Well, my guess is there is not one right answer to that question, right? That's a, an edge question. It's not unimportant. Right. But but there's but it isn't the case that you do it one way or the highway. You know, in other words, you do it my way or the highway. You do it the way that we propose right now, or you're not participatory economics. So it's an edge feature. Steve? Oh wait, Erska, you were next. Um, yeah, so I, I also want to go back a little to the environment sustainability issue, and I agree with what's being said in the chat. Uh, I was just thinking also before that I think that uh, especially the um, consumers, consumer councils and participatory planning will be uh, very much affected, but by what will be going on in the kinship and community sphere. Yeah especially regard, regarding the environment and also uh, animals animals uh, because mm -hmm. i think that uh, in the participatory society kinship and community will definitely include the kinship to animals more than it does now much more so that the animals will be um, i think should be and i i think it, they will be recognized as uh, persons with inherent value not only economic value uh, so i think this will come about and uh, so I, um, I was thinking if we should introduce another sphere, but then I was thinking no, because it will be like intersectionality, intersectional, intersectionality, intersectional connected with all other uh, spheres, and also I think kinship will deeply affect the balanced job complexes because um, the the work that that is done at home. I think should be included in the balanced job complex, not only the work that is done at the workplace, but also what is done in a home environment. So yeah, this was what I was thinking. Um, okay, I, I don't want to try and deal with all of that, but but the the animal thing is interesting, and there's there's a there's an analogy with people. That is to say, um, suppose you're thinking about investment, and you're thinking about how much is going to be allocated, right, to, um, to, to new equipment and to increasing productive potentials or reducing the burdens of work or whatever, right, in the future. Well, everything that you're going to allot to that could have been allotted to more violins, more food, more whatever in the present, right? And interestingly enough, the future people are not around. We don't have, we can't call them up and ask them, right? And so there's a little bit of a problem here. Um, and it's a problem for participatory planning writ large. It's how does, how does the self-management of the future people with regard to what we invest get embodied in the planning system? That's sort of analogous to, to the extent that you want to say, and I think, Erska, you were wanting to say this, um, dogs and cats and owls and uh, blue jays and whatever, right, are also impacted by what's going on in our society, right? And to what extent should they have, should their situation impact the, the choices that occur? Well, the economy cannot incorporate them as self-managing entities because they don't you can't do it so somebody has to do it for them somebody has to take their side so to speak right and i think that happens through the state but somebody else may say no put it in the economy somehow you know i don't know 
I mean, we'll see what, you know, participatory economy and participatory society and all of the other stuff, it's going to emerge, we hope, over time and be incredibly impacted, not only by each, but also by the lessons learned. So for instance, the lessons learned in early participatory planning are certainly going to in impact how participatory planning is done later, or at least we certainly hope they will. So we, our task is just to do the best we can at, I think, the scaffold and instances from the edge, so to speak, to communicate the, the fullness of the vision without making it a blueprint that, that people feel is a constraint. I hope that's, that's clear. Um, Steve, you were going to be next. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, I've uh, concluded in part on the basis of this discussion that the uh, description of one of the scaffold features, and I'd rather just call them fundamental or primary features and Fine. secondary, edge seems very uh, counterintuitive. And if you meet someone on the street and say, I want to talk about edges, you know, their head will blow up. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it seems to me that the principle of remuneration, the real fundamental principle is that remuneration shall consist of socially determined need plus effort, sacrifice, et cetera. And people who want to give a big component to that socially determined need will vote for that. People, a purist who says, um, no, there should, nothing should be uh, guaranteed. It should all come out of uh, uh, sacrifice, effort, et cetera, will make that low. And so there'll be continuing debates in a participatory society over, okay, I want to include food, housing, and medical care. Somebody else says, I want to include uh, food, housing, medical care, clothing, and transportation, uh, and so on. Um, those are, you know, important debates, but they're not fundamental. The fundamental point is, and Michael has certainly agreed that um, the political system could agree to have a, a need component, and people who've been pushing need um, don't say that that becomes everything, that there's no uh, component for effort and sacrifice. And so I, I think this is a more general way to phrase the principle, and then the rest becomes secondary. Okay, that, and we could do that. Um, my, in, my initial reaction is it is um, confused. Uh, apologies. Um, <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't mean anything in practice. It sounds good emotionally and value-wise, right? But it ignores that when you say something is what you're calling social need, which is simply met, therefore a free good, right? You are removing the mechanism by which we we ascertain how much it's desired. It's just that it is desired and what goes into it and by which we make those choices. So if you make clothing and you make housing free, you say nothing about, forget the non-free stuff, you say nothing about what's the, what's the right, fair, equitable, just apportionment of stuff to clothing or to housing, right? After you, you have to, you have to, um, uh, or I think you have to have an indicator of the desire of people, the need of people, if you want, right, for these different things. Otherwise, if I just say I want clothes, I want housing. Everybody else says I want clothes, I want housing. Well, how much housing? 
How much clothes? It's not a it, why it's real. There's gigantic differences right now. Right, but but if we guarantee everybody housing, it doesn't mean that you who want a a fifty room mansion uh, are entitled to a fifty room mansion. It means some minimal level of housing. Does that mean everybody right? gets the minimal level and nothing more? No, it means that what's what is socially provided is the minimal level, and the rest comes out of your uh, your funds that you have accumulated because of your um, work effort, effort and uh, sacrifice right. doing socially desirable work. Yeah, and you describe a mechanism by which I think we shouldn't probably spend too long on this, but you describe a mechanism by which, in the political sphere, presumably or maybe in the councils, whatever, um, we vote and we allocate that a certain amount is going to be the you know, this provided amount, right? Whether we're talking, whatever we're talking about. Uh, how does somebody make that vote intelligently? Um, by what criteria? How does, how does anybody know how to, this is really just a version of, from each according to, to each according to, except limited to a subset. Now, I'm not disagreeing with you that we do that because I think we do that for, for hospital care, you know, for penicillin, for various things. Okay, yeah, but, but one so of the you, interesting things about those things is you don't want more to be more fulfilled. You want them because you really fucking need them. Right. But when but when uh, somebody says, I think for my medical care, I need to have a personal masseuse um, and th you know, that yeah. visits me at home 365 days a year, um, society might say, well, that's like the 10-room mansion. Um, uh, no, uh, you can pay for that if you want, but what we're guaranteeing you is um, a certain number of visits to a uh, physical therapist, right? right? Or, or, or whatever, but no, that's something extra. I think okay, that I, it will... I, I don't it will wanna... Yeah, okay. I, I, I think it will turn out that equitable remuneration, right, and remuner which remuneration for duration, intensity, onerousness, at, which gives us income, right, enables us to do precisely what you want to get the amount we want consistent with our overall budget, right? And it's not denying anybody anything. See, if, if you're saying, and if somebody else is saying, maybe Peter is saying, um, I'm worried that our economy won't deliver housing to everybody. I'm worried that our economy won't deliver clothing to everybody. Okay, I get it, right? Uh, then I, then, you know, of course, right? But what, the, what, the, what you'd be saying in that case is it would be a mistake for us to be allotting allocative potential, right, to various other things and not providing housing and food but that's exactly what consumer desires reveal that people want housing and want food and if if everything is in shortage they want that before they want frivolous stuff or whatever anyway let's leave it but but um What's interesting about the whole discussion, of course, is the more you discuss this stuff, the more interesting um, in, um, uh, wrinkles or big wrinkles uh, emerge. Go ahead, Peter. Okay. Yeah. So I agree with Steve about the scaffolding edge. I'm not sure primary and secondary, but you mean I the keep, words? The words, I think, yeah, it's not central, but I do think you should change them. Yeah. I want to go back to the needs thing a second. I know Michael and I have disagreed respectfully about needs for 40 years. So I don't think it's that complicated to talk about, like Steve said, basic needs. That default is all people have the same needs. But I want to come back to a question. I, I'll use the scaffolding and edge if I can remember which one is which. So take the issue of child care. Okay. So I would say child care is a need. The question is, and you know, there shouldn't be a price on it, but of course somebody pays for it. So the question is, is it the local consumer council who pays for it, meaning reducing the individual consumption of everybody else, or is it society as a whole? 
I would argue society as a whole, and the many things like the same with the healthcare, because you know, healthcare may vary by communities, you know, particularly areas that have been very polluted. So the question is, if it's paid for by society as a whole, it can't be done then differently by different communities. Stephen terms of what he's saying, it seems to me it has to be a social decision for the entire society. You can't have some society <laughs> saying, yes, it's paid for by the local consumer council, others saying, you know, the neighborhood, the state, the whole society. So I was just saying part of this question is who who pays for these basic needs? Is that clear, Michael, what I was saying on that? Yeah, I mean, you're it's clearly it's it's right. That is, it, we're not saying that something is free, meaning it drops from trees and right. it involves nothing. Anything has costs. And it takes stuff to make it. It takes labor, et cetera, et cetera. And you're saying that's paid for by somebody, right? It's not paid for in the sense that you out, you know, you lay out a bill but right. paid for because it's it's stuff that's happening and other stuff isn't happening and it affects in the end what people are getting and so you're saying various things and we agree various things um should be paid for socially in essence right so if you if you pay for penicillin socially and you produce penicillin right that's it's it's been paid for socially in the following sense however much penicillin you did that reduce the overall output of the whole society and everybody's getting a little less and that means everybody is in a sense paying for that penicillin and if i get it and peter doesn't peter is subsidizing me in some sense that's true and no, that's I'm what saying, that's what it is for free, free goods a local park the people or the communities that use that park they would be charged for it in a sense less individual yeah. consumption but I'm saying the question a lot of this is that society as a whole, then you can't have differences versus some sub part right. of it. And I'm saying right. my tendency would be a lot of, of this would be paid, like the childcare example, would be a societal cost, not a community cost. So, you know, there's, so, and that right. makes it impossible to have differences between communities then. And the only problem now is um, People saying, I don't know whether I would say, you know, people saying, sure, society is going to provide child care. I want different child care than that other person wants. And I don't want society determining it. I want, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So everything opens a can of worms. No, um, Steve dealt with that. Yeah, I think Steve dealt with this at a basic level. And then above that, maybe we'd be paid for in a different yeah. way. So I I just think it's complicating it with no gain and maybe loss. But let's not debate it, right? Yeah. I, I want to get the the uh, essential idea of what it means to debate these things or to differ about these things, right? So if we differ about if somebody says, um, uh, you know, let's forget balanced job complexes or let's forget. Uh, participatory planning or let's figure whatever you know whichever of the five uh, for the minute we'll call it five um, and you're debating it is that different than somebody says um, look inside the workplace the way that workers should allocate income to each other is the following and somebody else says no I don't think that or Peter says just now the way that consumer councils should allocate the cost of the park in the community is x and somebody else says no it's y right i think it should be y what i'm trying to get across is that that these are different kinds of difference and and one kind is more fundamental one kind sometimes should lead to splits let's make it you know uh those kinds of terms that people get. The other time, kind should never lead to splits, right? When arguing about contingent attributes that future people should be deciding and that are not essential to the, you know, that should not lead to splits, but it does, but it shouldn't, right? When arguing about, do we have private property or not? Do we have uh, productive commons or do we have private property? That's more fundamental, right? And one can imagine these kinds of differences, <clears throat> ones that we should be able to say, we'll agree to disagree. 
and ones that we should be able to say, no, that disagreement puts us in two different ballparks, right? That I think holds for vision per se. Um, but I also think it holds for other realms. Um, Lonnie, will you let me change the subject? And then we'll come back. Um, take arguments about, uh, I don't know, the Ukraine, or take arguments about um, uh, seeking a, a, uh, a higher minimum wage, or arguments about, and you can imagine, you know, an infinitude of things that um, people might, electoral strategy, using sabotage, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm wondering, I'm not sure what I think about this, but I'm wondering if this kind of way of thinking about identifying attributes, key attributes and secondary attributes, let's call it, or defining attributes and peripheral or defining and contingent, right, um, applies all the time, right? So maybe somebody can bring up a, a kind of dispute if not, I'll do it, but a, a kind of dispute that exists that is fundamental and a kind of dispute that exists is a fight, but it's not getting to the heart of the matter, or it's not about the heart of the matter. It should not lead to splits. Lonnie, your hand's staying up. Maybe you were already were moving in this direction. Go ahead. So, yeah, I, I think that I might have... I wanted to get your take on whether you thought that this was that type of a situation where it's a scaffolding or a situation or whether it's just an edge of situation. So, um, I, and this goes back to, um, to both uh, Peter and Steve's uh, situation, but also it addresses what Ershka and some of the other people were talking about with the animals. So I, I, I would disagree with you on, on one area that you said you thought that that, that type of stuff might be for the state. And I don't even know if I'm really disagreeing, but I, I think that it's a, it shows the combination of, uh, of what the, the state, uh, what some of that uh, interaction with the state would also be interaction with the economy in the sense that we might have overall uh, values voting to guide us on these things. So we're not having to do them all the time. And so this goes to the idea of participatory planning. So um, if participatory planning is going to meet uh, one of the core values, sustainability, I think then we have a really big task of defining what sustainability means. And I think that you can absolutely incorporate the welfare of plants, animals, uh, the earth itself, uh, all, all these things in with sustainability. And you should simply because that's what we're trying to avoid is externalities. And so externalities uh, and, you, and you think about how many things are, are intertwined, uh, then I, I think that it's a given that animals would be considered in with the value of sustainability. Now, where I'm, where I'm wondering is, is that it's at some point, it seems to me that if you are going to have sustainability, if you are going to avoid externalities, um, those are really complex things. And then it brings into, into, view uh, your facilitation or iteration boards. And at that point, I start to wonder, um, because those things have such a huge role to play outside of simply consumers making decisions and workers councils making decisions, at that point, um, does the participatory planning uh, boards themselves, do they become uh, almost a separate entity or, or a separate part of the scaffolding. They may not, but um, if, if you think about uh, all, all the stuff that we're talking about, if you, if you want to factor in uh, animals, if you want to factor in, uh, like most of us don't have the information or the understanding to, to, uh, to wrap our heads around what our, uh, our consumer decisions are going to mean to the oceans or to the glaciers or to the Amazon rainforest, right? That's going to be a matter of the, the data that's crunched in a facilitation board. And so a lot of this is about what data we put into it and what our capacity uh, to, to crunch that data is. And so I'm curious, uh, and, and I actually think that if we look at the facilitation board as being that 
important. Um, do we make it its own part of the scaffold or is it simply just part of the participatory planning? Um, I actually, in the, in the chapter I'm writing for the RU2 book, I, I bring up another uh, entity similar to a facilitation board that I think uh, also goes towards the importance of trying to improve sustainability. But at that point, I don't know, is that part of participatory planning as well or is it its own thing? Right. And, or is it part of the state? The same way that kinship with labor it overlaps like a Venn diagram with the economy and labor, right? When we're talking about balanced jobs, balanced roles or whatever, the same way I think the state itself uh, overlaps in some areas when we talk about consumers or just citizens themselves uh, having votes on larger qualitative value decisions that then get factored into how these things get done. So I don't know if any of that made sense, but I guess I'm just trying to figure out um, uh, is that an issue where it's a problem with the scaffold or just it's a really large edge uh, uh, issue? <laughs> um, I don't know whether the last comment helped, but um, but it's of course it makes sense. Um, we're in a workplace and we're trying to paint it. I've used this example before. If there's no experts to tell us lead paint is bad, we choose lead paint because we like the color. If something, right, has told us lead paint is no good, right, um, and why, then, then you know, we, we don't want to use the lead paint because of its implications. That's not the facilitation board. You're saying something similar. You're saying if we don't know, if we don't have um, the insight and the assessment of ecological implications, right? Our decisions won't properly take them into account and won't yield sustainability. True. That's not the facilitation board. That's just like if if the hospital or the or the medical workplace doesn't tell us about um, the pandemic, right? We won't produce vaccines, right? It, so it's true. Yeah, I mean, what you're saying is very true, but I don't think it's, I think it's, you're saying a, a good society generates insights and information and knowledge, and that doesn't come only from the entirety of the population organized as consumers or producers. A lot of it comes from expert investigation, research, um, uh, the, the compiling of the data and assessing it, all true. But that's not the facilitation board. But the, um, facil and so but the facilitation board is going to have to uh, factor in all of that information uh, if it's going to do even a half-assed job at, at no, any kind of sustainability. The I mean, the job that you can't you can't even talk you can't even uh, you can't even say that we're going to have a, a, an economy that doesn't have externalities if the if a facilitation board is not including these wait, factors wait, into wait, wait. the equation. There's all these factors that you're thinking about, right? And you're saying, well, the facilitation board has to do that. It has to, not that it has to generate the research, but it has to incorporate the research into the planning process. That's what you're saying, right? Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is, uh, no, the workers and consumers councils have to. I think that that's the impl Well, I, think I, that's I, I don't think so. Take the, take the let case me, of the let pandemic. Me why, let me at least say why, and then you can, you can, uh, you can respond to that, because right. if, you, if you think about the massive amount of externalities that are even possible in just the purchasing of one product, okay, the idea that every consumer is supposed to uh, have the no. information... Yeah. The education, the grasp on all these things, that and and it's solely on between them and the workers' councils. To me, that makes no sense whatsoever. I I can't even read. It's also it. not what I'm saying. What the okay. ingredients all are. It, well, go, let go back to the workers' council deciding on paint. Right. It's not going to be the case that every worker in the workers' council, or probably any worker in the workers' council knows why lead in the paint has the particular effects that it has. But the knowledge that it does will be available. 
And the knowledge that it does will impact the choice of pain. I mean, it won't even come up as an issue. Take the pandemic. No, right now, we don't know squat. You and I don't know jack shit about um, COVID, right? Ultimately, really, we don't know very much. Um, and it isn't obvious that anybody else does either. But, but suppose the knowledge really exists. Then, then the knowledge has to impact people's, people's preferences. When you say that every item affects every other item, and so how can people deal with that? That's exactly what values and prices are about. That's exactly what an allocation system is accomplishing for people. We're not going to resolve this now. Maybe you're right. Maybe I'm right. Or maybe something completely different is necessary. I'm, not saying, I'm saying that that if they're going, that, that there's more than just the just your vote as a consumer or the same of course. At, at the council. Than, than just the quantitative of what I want to either do or what, what I want to consume, yeah. that, it's, it, that you have to, at that point, start, uh, you have to have input on the general uh, values of these things because you simply are not going to understand uh, how simply, uh, even the workers at that point. The, the Let me ask you a question. That, when you say- of, of every uh, possible outcome of, of them making a decision when they don't, when they're not experts in 10 different fields, then I, don't, you're it's, left with making both quantitative and qualitative choices. And the participatory planning boards, I, I feel like are going to be responsible for crunching the data to figure out what those decisions are actually going to do. And, and then coming back with, uh, like you said, a second round of things based on well, you made this decision, but here's what you didn't know that it was going to do. Okay, so that that is a variant on, right? I'm not, I'm not saying we agree completely, but that's a variant on including qualitative information and the exchange of information so that it can impact the choices and even the facilitation board. Okay, so I'm not disagreeing with you there, but I think you're underestimating the extent to which the planning process is saying, look, if you properly price things, if you properly respect the, you know, all of the inputs and the outputs and the personal, social, and uh, ecological implications in pricing, you're automatically making the decisions. Now, the extreme version of that is that's all you have to do. You don't need any discussion of anything qualitative, right? And it just is wasting time. The version that comes closer to you is that, no, it's not all you need to do. You need to have um, a, a qualitative discourse take place, right? And the more that you want, the more those two things are in opposition to each other. But um, it's it's it's... At least in, in participatory economics, it's not the participant, it's not the iteration facilitation board. It's something else that would be impacted, right? It, it's um, it, where workplaces have a, 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 a division, let's call it, and a job which is associated with providing qualitative descriptions, right? Beyond just their, their registering how much they want to produce. Will consumer councils? have something similar, right? Rep presenting qualitative information. And will that information be visible so that the brilliant insights of either the research unit or maybe even a council or a workplace, right? Are, you know, go through the economy. And, and we don't disagree about that, um, actually, uh, I don't think. But I'm not sure. I, I that, but I, I think then that maybe we just have, maybe our issue is 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 not exactly what the consumer councils and workers councils might be doing. Maybe our difference is over what a facilitation board looks like. Because if it does not, if a facil facilitation board is not a factoring as as Matisse said, externalities, if it's not factoring in all the information from all these different experts, from all these different organizations and universities that work on this stuff, if they're not using that and part of the the, pro the, the process for our uh, to, to take our wants and then to produce our outcomes, if they're not the ones doing this, 
Then um, who is? I, I don't. I don't I have no understanding of, of of participatory planning whatsoever. Then, and and, okay. and that's why I'm. I, okay. I, I, I cannot <laughs> believe. I, I cannot believe that uh, that even highly educated individuals are are, are supposed to make. Uh, the, the, Lana, the you're going from one extreme to another extreme. You're you're going from a facilitation board who has that has a very limited job. In fact, we believe the facilitation board can be a computer, right? And an algorithm. To, and that's obviously not going to accomplish what you're talking about. I agree with you, right? And then you're going to individuals are doing it, right? And, and it's, it's popping up in your head as workers and consumers councils are going to do it. But neither is the answer, I think, right? So we're not disagreeing that it should happen. We're just disagreeing that those are the only two options. And since workers and consumers councils can't do it because nobody knows, you know, the, the, the facilitation board, that's, that's our difference. I think there's a different way of doing it. But as this isn't supposed to be a, a discussion, although it's very good, a discussion of just participatory economics per se, I, I do want to try and um, get this additional little do that. I've lost all my outlines, so that takes care of that. Um, and time is going. Let me at least get the last thing in. Suppose, uh, suppose uh, Peter says, "I want uh, to win a higher minimum wage. I want to win the higher minimum wage because a higher minimum wage will fulfill needs of people whose." Needs are not being met uh, now as well as they should be. And he might add on some more um, additional features, but let's settle for that for a minute. And a right winger comes along and says, I don't want to have a minimum wage. And the reason I don't want to have it is because it won't meet those needs. And in fact, it will fuck up the economy and more people will be denied fulfillment. What kind of disagreement is that? And that's what they'll say. And at least it looks like it's a disagreement over the fact of the matter, not over what Lonnie was driving out at the beginning, the underlying values. Both sides are saying the same thing about underlying values. We want people to be fulfilled. One side saying this will help. The other side saying this will make a fucking mess. All right, so take a different one. But, but we know, everybody here knows that, wait a minute, this is fundamental. It's not a case like we're arguing over something contingent as compared to something essential. But why do we know that? Take a different one. Um, uh, the war in Ukraine. So... One person says uh, the West is responsible and the West should pursue negotiations and even the West should stop arming Ukraine or drastically cut back armaments. The other side says Russia is responsible. Um, uh, I forget what the second thing was already that I said. Um, Russia is responsible. Armaments should continue. Um, takes the opposite position. Now, when is that a, a difference that warrants something like a split? You know, these two people are just, and when is that a difference, which is, it ought to be possible to agree to disagree and not split. And the same thing for the minimum wage thing. And does, does this whole idea of essential and contingent somehow carry over in a way? I think it's worth thinking about. I think it might give us a way to avoid a whole lot of needless misunderstanding. So does anybody want, why is the difference between Peter on minimum wage, and I wish I knew the names of all the assholes, but I don't, uh, who says no minimum wage. Why is that fundamental? 
I think the only reason is because the asshole's lying. When the asshole says, I'm concerned about meeting people's needs that are undermet, I think he's lying, right? If he really is saying that, then, then there's, you know, it's a dispute about facts. But I think he's lying. Now take the war. If, if, if they both are really saying the well-being of Ukraine, the well-being of the entire planet, et cetera, et cetera, is what I'm driven by, and I disagree about facts, that's one thing. If, in fact, the person who's saying, you know, the United States should, um, you know, give them arms until there are no arms left or so whatever it is that they're saying if they're saying it to pursue american foreign policy not to pursue the well-being of ukrainians in the world that's different than if it's because they understand the facts differently this is trivial and yet i don't think it's the way we approach differences all right i think we tend to reflexively assume the worst of of the other and so does the other assume the worst of us and it isn't always the case if a trump supporter supports trump and the reason and it really is the reason right is because they believe that trump is a gadfly and everything sucks and maybe something good will come of it and in any event he at least seems to understand working people and he's not like you know a coordinator class asshole of course he's a ruling class asshole but set that aside and somebody else has the opposite of point again is it is one side lying and their motives are hidden or not it's uh you know I, I, maybe this is of no interest to anybody else to me it seems like it has a lot to do with a lot of the ways that we split that we need not or ought not. Um, and a lot of the ways that we feel attacked that we ought not. Um, I mean, for look, Lonnie just said, what did you say? It's crazy. Uh, that didn't bother me at all. Right? I didn't think he was calling me crazy. I didn't think he was calling me stupid. I didn't think he was, I don't think he was doing anything like that. He was saying this idea seems to me to be horribly flawed um, or to have an implication that you haven't taken account of, both of which could be true. But it's hard for people to deal with that kind of situation. All right, I'm rambling. Uh, I guess we're now into anything that anybody wants to talk about, yeah? But but if it's this last thing, that might be good. Not much interest in this last thing. <laughs> uh, I wish Steve was here. He's not, right? Did he go? He went. I mean, because it's an example. He's having... A debate, you could call it, with Noam. And I think it's a civilized, mutually respectful debate. But there are other people having the exact same debate, and they're ready to kill each other. And I'm not sure that it's always warranted. Um, sometimes it might be because the one side's lying, right? But, but... Uh, I'm not sure I pronounce you. Miko, is that it? Uh, yes, yes, Miko. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I very much recognize uh, this this um, lack of ability to, to have a have a proper de debate uh, in the world. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm just having a little trouble uh, understanding. Go ahead. <laughs> very hard to okay. understand. Oh, is my connection bad? I think it's been a bit tough. To... Yes, it, it, uh, the sound is not so good yet. Okay, let me see if I stop my video. Maybe. Is it better Just now? Can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead, Miko. 
Okay, very cool. Um, yeah, so yeah, I do re do recognize um, the lack uh, uh, of difficulty that we have been over uh, uh, discussing the crazy with people, especially if they're on on uh, uh, very very far far. Uh, we don't hear you. Yeah, I think you're too far from the microphone or something. It's not picking up. Oh yeah. Uh, okay. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, and also I think seeing you helps. At least it helps oh, yeah. me. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah. If it's not a connection problem. Yeah. All right. So um. Okay. Let me just try to get to the point. Um. Um. Uh, so yeah, um, yeah. I do, do think it's it's um, yeah. What what uh, what what stands on the capitalist realism uh, is is um, that a lot of people are very deeply into deep into and and uh, and and, and uh, I think this group uh, being uh, very much on a different different uh, plane of realism uh, that can. Uh, uh, cause a, a disconnect and, and, and make it difficult for uh, to to reach uh, reach of people or even even have a have a discussion on, on, on things that you don't necessarily uh, uh, you recognize the problem like like uh, Michael mentioned with Trump some uh, some voters you know there's also a lot of working class people voting for Trump and, and they are basically struggling with the same problems of, of reality that that any any working class people. But their solution is, is very different because they are uh, falling to the they are falling to the rabbit hole of them or they are just mud uh, everything realism. Um so yeah I, I do recognize recognize that uh, that's not very nice. Yeah, that's what I want to say at this point. Uh, if somebody else wants to respond, I I'm I apologize, but I couldn't understand. Does somebody want to respond to? Travis, are you raising your hand to respond to Miko? Uh, yeah, well, I wanted, I th it seemed like I couldn't hear everything, but it seemed like we were saying was like um, that to, to Michael's point, I think capitalist realism is a big factor in that. So and he talked about, you know, black people voting for, Trump and stuff. So it's, it's the idea that like um, people like those black people aren't lying, you know, things like that. And and so there's no reason for like to get reactive, you know, when they when a when someone argues their point. Like it's basically agreeing with you michael but saying i think capitalist realism plays a part in it um that people sure that, that capitalist realism um it's like the idea it's how like the thinking outside of thinking of an alternative system or think it's basically i'm sorry i'm not explaining it right but it's how people think in terms of capitalism all the time. They don't even, it's like they don't even consider or think about an alternative. So they literally, the way they think is in the confines of that. That's what it is. So there's like a really famous book written about it. Um, but that plays a role. If I'm understanding correctly, I might not be, but I think that was. Would it be the same thing yes. as patriarchy realism? in which huge numbers of people simply accept patriarchy and take it for granted, like accepting capitalism and taking it for granted and not being able to sort of think of alternatives like different ways of organizing to bring up kids, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. See, I, but I think that the reason that, that many more people on the left are familiar with what you're calling capitalist realism or whatever the name was, um, and and see it is because they're not as attuned, not a criticism, but they're not as attuned to say race or gender in the same way. I mean, you know, the thinking in racial terms that are racist um, is also commonplace. Um, 
anyway, I, that's a whole separate thing from, is there anything to be said for the approach, essential peripheral, um, defining contingent, or however you want to work it, as a first step before people start arguing, um, so as to realize whether they're arguing about anything that, you know, should should weigh heavily on their relations to each other or how they see each other. Um, I think maybe there is, but I don't know. Anybody else? Marsha had hand up earlier. Sorry, who? Oh, Marsha, go ahead. Is my hand was my hand still up? I, I put it down because we're low on time, but um uh, I had a number of questions, but um, they can be taken at a rug meeting. Um, I just wanted to say if, that people shouldn't kill each other when they disagree, because um, there might be one person left if that were so. Um, <laughs> anyway, yeah, I, I can I can save the questions for later. Okay. Wait, let, so let's take an example from the participatory economics part, because people were obviously very into that. So I'll make it personal. R Robin says that in participatory planning, a very high importance factor is the speed and the simplicity, the non, you know, demands upon the participants at, in which the plan process arrives at the plan. And that that factor, the time of it, um, is, a, is a potential gigantic impediment to people taking it seriously. And um, at the same time, seeing that uh, talking about qualitative information and in, incorporating qualitative information, and by the way, he's true in that, you know, that's not wrong. Uh, what, what I just said he feels is true. Um, and the second thing would be that qualitative information um, takes time. It, it, this is the opposite of, uh, it bears upon what Lonnie, Lonnie was raising. The idea is if you can encapsulate the information into prices, and if using prices will yield the outcome that, that you know, tremendous attention to all possible information would yield, then it's very, very efficient in the sense of saving time, right? Um, the opposite or the, a different position is to say, uh, time isn't that much of a factor. It's a factor, but it's not that much of a factor, especially since we're talking about time spent controlling your life. Um, and the qualitative information is really important because we can't make those prices, those values so perfect. And because we can't, have them progress over time without some input of qualitative information. And so this is a difference and it's one of the differences that exists. Um, here's another one, participatory, between us, participatory planning is um, incredibly important as a distinguishing feature and attention to it and to getting across its validity and its effectiveness, its worth, is paramount. And this attention to balanced job complex is not so much. Not that it's not part of the thing, but that emphasizing that has, let's say, a, 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 an impact that can put people off. So this is a difference about how to talk about the whole thing. These are differences that should not cause uh, splits or serious tension or disparagement or anything like that, right? On the other hand, if one of us said all of a sudden, you know, fuck participatory planning, let's use markets. It's much simpler. Everybody will, will know what we're talking about and we'll be fine. That would be a big difference that would warrant, um, you know, and, and so discerning that in the first place, 
what we're arguing about something contingent something that we're ultimately not going to decide something that's not real you know or something that's fundamental is it matters ian yeah uh i was going to bring this up i think uh before you started mentioning or uh bringing up a new example uh michael but uh yeah i, I guess i i was thinking of it as more of where do you draw that line in the argument is it based on the values like you're saying if, if they think oh it's markets or in in a case that i was going to bring up as an example i i ran into this summer it was a group of socialists at this you know socialist school thing that they did uh and brought a bunch of like-minded marxists out and uh they had a session on on utopianism and marxism and um yeah it was sort of this idea of you know do, no one brought up that central planning might be a bad thing um and when i proposed it i got a bit of pushback uh <laughs> and 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 you know and talking about you know like what what why why stalinism was a a, a a potential rise and everything um and i i think that their, their their lack of vision was was something that that wasn't very apparent or at least maybe it, it in a way it seemed almost more utopian uh because a lot of what was just spouted as sort of future vision was the the old axiom of each according to uh need or according to work and need um and and yet there you know like when i when i mentioned something about uh participatory planning it was said that oh wait you know that'll 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 be too hard and and people won't want to do it um because it's it's going to take too much time and effort by the community, so therefore we need something like a, some kind of board to do it for them. Uh, but yet, when they talk about you know this, when I brought up this idea of a third class, uh, they also didn't agree with that. They thought that you only basically you have capital or you don't have capital. That's it. So you know this this it didn't seem like this should be a huge difference, but apparently it, it kind of was for some reason, and I had to explain why there was this third class and uh, uh another person in the group mentioned well you know as long as we get rid of capitalism and everything's focused on getting rid of capitalism and showing that you know the workers and the, the big fight between the workers and the capitalists uh then the workers themselves will just figure things out and they'll figure out how to avoid this corporate structure on their own yet the yet the contradiction of you know there being too much effort to put into planning Anyway, I, uh, I, I saw that as <laughs> a big issue, and I wish I had more time to discuss with everybody in that group. But it was it was very very um, eye opening experience for me uh, coming from a group which I was hoping it was international too. It was a, a bunch of folks from the U.S. and international coming out to this event, and the sort of unified <laughs> unified vision that everyone had um, it, it kind of played into this purity of of the of socialism that I think is uh, it, it's it's counterintuitive. It doesn't help the 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 process I think for getting new recruits in a way because it's um, basically it's our way and everyone else everyone else has bad politics or something. So uh, yeah, I guess it's it's something I've struggled with to try to um, even just bring up that discussion with like-minded socialists or like-minded leftists um, that seem to have that 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 adherence to an old central planning style or you know or even just in a way it's more utopian and thinking that it'll just work itself out without having any real vision yeah but is there is there an example of this that is non split like and an example that's split like i think so so for instance if if you're talking with somebody who says uh, there is no third class, there is no, you know, central planning is fine, et cetera, et cetera. And you say, well, do you think that there should be 20% of the population uh, making all the decisions uh, that impact 80%? And they say, no, um, but I don't think that'll happen. So now you're having an argument, or at least superficially, it looks like you're having an argument over the implications of some institutions. Right. They're not saying we want this, this. But now if another person comes along and says, well, of course, 20 percent should make the decisions because 20 percent know what they're doing and 80 percent don't. Now, it might be the first person thought that also, 
right? But if somebody does say that, now you have a, a different kind of, of of difference, right? That, that was and, sort of the answer I was getting. That some folks are like, I'd rather someone else make these tough decisions for me. Yeah, <laughs> these well, are socialists, so, so-called. Yeah. So, anyway, but that I mean, you know, so that's the issue. If if somebody says about the war, um, you know, well, I want the United States to run the world. Um, and somebody else says, well, I want to, with the same policy positions, says, I want to, you know, minimize the, the pain and suffering and bring the war to its conclusion. There's a difference over facts, maybe, um, unless somebody is deceiving themselves or deceiving you. But the trick is we always jump to the conclusion that somebody is deceiving themselves. You know what I mean? Or deceiving us or knows what they're talking about and they're deceiving us. And I don't think it's always true. I think these differences are often honest differences and, uh, and not about underlying values. All right, I'll take it. Here's an extreme example. A kid grows up in a neighborhood is continually at odds with blacks in the neighborhood the kid is white his experience is of hostility and anger that's what he knows at the age of 18 and he and he manifests some racist policy inclinations right so it could be that he has become sincere seriously racist in his view and even that we might understand, but it could be also that he's just trying to deal with a difficult situation. You know, I, we always assume, well, I shouldn't say we always assume the worst, but lots of people on the left always tend to assume the worst. Often because it makes them look better. I think. Anyway, I'm suggesting that maybe this approach to finding what's essential and what's contingent and what's value determined as compared to fact governed um, should matter in how we address each ourselves and our differences in each other and all the rest of it. Go ahead, Lonnie. Yeah, I would, uh, I, I would agree on even, uh, I would even take a step back and say that, like, I feel like that uh, that because the the road to a participatory economy or the or a participatory society is going to be a <laughs> we would imagine a long road with many steps uh, along the way. I don't have a problem with uh, with. Uh, having folks that completely disagree with participatory economics uh, be uh, on board with us planning on steps, at least in that general direction. And I think that that's important as well, because um, for all I know, they might be right. Um, but I feel like that that's where the values comes back in. If we can agree on the general idea of what a society is gonna look like, what the outcome would be, what those values are, and then if we have a shared uh, like key or, you know, shared uh, common understanding of what those values are, then as we go along those steps and we can start uh, using trial and error to see what things are working and what are not, what are producing those uh, values, then, uh, then it, it's better that we took those steps rather than argued it out and didn't take any of those steps. And I, I feel like that most on the left uh, agree with the values that we have laid out and that we can start taking some some if not many of those steps in in that general shared direction uh, of the values even if we disagree with what the the core institutions are going to look like and so it's not just within uh like are you or, or or just people who advocate for participatory economics right. i think that's the, the left it, it broadly the pushback would be that if you do that in some domains, the weight of the present, right, is so great that it overwhelms any innovation. You're, in other words, 
you really have to push hard for certain kinds of insights and innovations because the weight of the present, the weight of common sense, as somebody referred to it, or the weight of our behaviors and our and our right is so great that you have to push hard against that. Um, it's a modest pushback because you know I also sort of agree with you, but but you can see the the, the dynamic. Um, anyway. Uh, others? Can anybody think of another kind of dispute, argument, disagreement, tension on the left that could benefit from this kind of thinking? as compared to just from patience and mutual respect, which is also needed, right? Um, I can think of one that might not benefit from it and require patience and mutual respect. So for instance, um, I, don't, I don't know exactly what your views on this are, are Erska, but you, you were certainly bringing up the idea that, um, or somebody might propose the idea that uh, you know, animals have rights just like people and should be regarded just like people and should be treated by all aspects of society like people in some sense. Um, and somebody else might say, well, no, you know, that just doesn't <laughs> resonate for me. Um, I remember at ZMI, Lonnie, you might've been there one of those years that it happened or Matisse, um, you know, there was a period when this was much stronger in the United States than it is now. And there would be people at ZMI who would say the restaurant, you know, just across the, the equivalent of two blocks from where we were, is like uh, Dachau or Auschwitz, right? They're cooking animals and it's like cooking people. And I'm not saying you say that, but they would say that. And I would get pissed. Um, and I would say, look, there's two possibilities. You really honestly believe that in which you're sitting two blocks from Dachau and not doing anything about it. Or you don't really honestly believe that. And you're just trying to provoke everybody. Um, and, uh, you know, so you can imagine some tension. I'm just trying to, right? And I'm not sure you can get over it in that case by discovering that it's the same values because one, you could have all the same values up to the animals and then there's just another value that's added, right? And, and it's a difference. I'm not sure it has to be a split. It could be mutually respectful, but that's not using the essential peripheral recognition. It's just using respect. Um, Go ahead, Erska. I didn't mean to center on that. Maybe that wasn't a good idea, but no, it's okay because I wanted to mention that also that I can imagine okay. that that could be. Uh, but uh, I was thinking that now, um, for example, on the left, these discussions um, are um, mostly focused around, for example, example if we just center around food, which is basically the most important thing in this, uh, because most of the animals are abused in the animal farming oh, so oh, it's like, okay. it makes sense to yeah so uh like the socialists uh, would argue here in this part of the world um those who are not already vegan would say that it's not uh, an issue now because the the food is so let's say vegan food is so expensive that uh, like an ordinary work working person cannot afford it uh, so this would be now the point of that's dispute. Yeah. So this okay, is so that's this. A, that, that's that's Other, avoiding the topic really. Yeah. Right? Otherwise, the in general, if you would organize something, uh, an event uh, with the anarchist people, uh, then the at the event the food would definitely be vegan, but the vegan like just the vegetables, homegrown vegetables and beans and things like that. So I think that. I think this 
is this dispute around animals is mostly centered around this economic point of view. And I think if we could solve this, I don't think there would be any issue around that anymore. Regarding the comparison to the concentration camp, and I think this was very popular in the like in the early 2000s. Yeah. Uh, but now in this um, like anti-speciesist movement is uh, not anymore because there are big differences, definitely. You know, because we we, we look at animals as uh, uh, as a market value thing yeah. while the you know the connection with concentration camp camp with the people that were killed there is completely different they weren't looked at as a like yeah. a, just a market value so that's why it's not uh, it's not correct to compare that but it was very popular in the early 2000s this comparison uh, so i think now this dispute is mostly around economic point of view yeah but the real issue isn't economics the real issue is the rights of Right. Noam was once asked about this. Um, he yeah. was asked, you know, what do you have to say about uh, animal rights and, and mm. the whole issues? And he answered, actually, in the way I think I would probably have to answer also, uh, and had answered it at ZMI, which was to say, I don't know. It may well be that down the road a ways, uh, this will, you know, animals will will be regarded in a very different way than now um, and will have rights and um, it will be a significant factor in how we conduct economics and so on and so forth. Um, but he said, uh, I'm pretty sure I'm remembering this correctly. He said, but now, um, you know, the prospects of making, you know, of, of that, being part of a process of trying to liberate humanity seems to me pretty slim, um, even though I acknowledge that it might become a part of that process. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, asked if he eats meat, he says, yes, you know, and that's what I have mm -hmm. to say. And I'm not sure mm -hmm. that I wouldn't say something quite different if I lived to be, you know, 30 years older and we made some changes. It's very possible because I certainly have qualms about it at times. But anyway, so that's as compared to the person who says, fuck the animals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, then, and then you have a real, you know, then you have a. Mm. I don't think we would get to that. I don't imagine that in participatory society, there would be a person who would say that. Yeah. Uh, who knows? I don't know. You know. I tend to think so, too. But, you know, anyway. Um you know, I, I find just going back to who was it? I think it was Ian. Um, the the interface between somebody like me, say, and I think most of you on this issue, or maybe all of you on this issue, and say a Trotskyist or a Marxist Leninist, I find that I have no trouble uh, talking to such folks until, at least most of them, until. Uh, the discussion veers into the past. Um, in other words, regarding the present, you can talk about, say, Leninist organization, and you can make points about it having implications that you don't like, and they might say, no, I don't think it has those, and so on, those implications, and you have the discussion. But the minute that you get to, um, you know, what did the Bolsheviks do, or something like that, it becomes impossible. Um, and I think it's because these positions owe more to identity and, uh, you know, almost group affiliation than to careful assessment about which people can disagree. Well, that's always seemed to me to be the case. Travis, your hand up. Yeah, um, the animal thing kind of relates to um, something I've come across that is one cause, I think, for, you know, disagreements between people that get out of hand or whatever. So, and it concerns, like, some people, it seems to me, and I met an anarchist the other night that this applies to, where they're so, 
they're they live in such an abstract world that when they try to come down and talk about something in the real world it's like they haven't been in the real world for so long that <laughs> they say the most ridiculous things it's like their abstract idea obviously doesn't translate to the real world but they think it does because they've been away from the real world for so long um so i think that you know i just think that's another cause of confusion between people can you give an example travis i want to but it's like i can't even remember what the guy said because it was so out there you know <laughs> he's talking about entropy and stuff and I can't, sure. can't. What, what does it mean to it. be what does it mean to be away from the real world what what do you have in mind when you say that i mean like well i mean sometimes it's like i would say continental philosophy i i mean i like some of it but i'm saying like some of it, the postmodernism stuff, those people sometimes get so far out there. Someone like Michael Foucault, right? I, I watched the Chomsky-Foucault debate from a long time ago, famous debate. And Foucault is like that. He's like, he's so in this abstract world that the things he's saying don't even make any logical sense. Why aren't like, I in an abstract world when I'm talking about participatory economics? Because it's grounded in some way. That's what I mean. It's almost like a psychological phenomenon I'm talking about of abstraction where you're so, you know what I mean? It's like a, I don't know exactly how to describe it, but an example Ushka, Ushka would be um, the Foucault debate, right? So it's like, oh, this stuff can be hard to talk about, but um, Foucault said something like, uh, you can't talk about justice at all because our notions of justice are determined by our social, the, the moment we're living in, social, relate, whatever, our environment, social relations, all this. And Noam was like, yeah, maybe it could, our notion of justice could change over time, but you still have to deal with the real world. And you, you can think about it, come up with, say, a vision um that incorporates our me our our the best we can do with our meaning of justice now and incorporate it but Foucault would say you can't do it you like you literally just can't do it Be, you know what I mean and it's like that's an example where how it's like a psychological phenomenon or something where they're in that abstract world and they can't come down and be grounded if that makes sense to people Joe? Yeah, I'd like to make a couple of fundamental points. Seems to me, back on the subject of animal uh, life, animal rights, that to disrespect animal life is to disrespect life itself. And, or as Marx declared, man is part of nature we are part of nature. We are a different form of life in a sense with our consciousness, but we still set, share the same organizational roots. The other point I want to make is that if a person doesn't believe in participatory economics, what is their view of human nature? Can vary. Social beings. And as Willie said a while ago, uh, a Zoom ago, that socialism is natural. It certainly is. It's our attempt to exist as natural beings on planet Earth, obeying, re revering the laws of life. And animals are as alive as we are and follow those same laws without the consciousness. Let me give you... An example that that might bear on that. Um, I'm not sure. Um, who was it that wrote the bell curve? Somebody? I guess you guys don't know. So there was this book called The Bell Curve, a very important book. I can't remember the two authors. And basically, the upshot of it was uh, um, genetic differences between blacks and whites, women and men, et cetera, et cetera consign groups to their position um, 
uh, we should allow people to arrive at their genetically determined position. And, but now they added on at the end, in essence, uh, we're not celebrating this. We don't like this. It's just the way it fucking is. And uh, if that was true, I guess it would be an argument over facts. And the book is a pile of statistics. It was shown to be garbage over time. But anyway, it was a pile of trying to prove the, the case. But if that wasn't true, which I don't think it was remotely the case, that they were bemoaning the fact, this, the simpler version of that is Margaret Thatcher gives up and says there is no alternative. If she's crying, when she says it, I can have lunch with her or dinner with her. I can respect that. You know, if she thinks there's no alternative and she's sad to say it, or the doctor gets up and says there's no alternative to cancer. But if the doctor gets up and says there's no alternative cancer is laughing and Margaret Thatcher gets up and says there's no alternative and is obviously happy about it, it's two very different things. One is an argument over facts and the other is an argument over values and, you know, just basic underlying commitments. Uh, but sometimes it's hidden, obviously. Go ahead, Lennon. Um, I was uh, thinking about uh, the way that um, that that you kind of uh, cleared up uh, that you didn't think that I was calling you crazy uh, earlier, and I think, <laughs> uh, probably, I think that's quite important because I know in a discussion. Are you going to tell me now that you were calling me crazy? No, 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 no. I, oh, no okay, what good. I, what I think is important is is that um, so I know that you. Uh, you know, you, when you and Peter talk, you know, you, you talk to him differently than if you were talking to somebody that you just met, right? And, uh, and when you and I talk, we, uh, you know, we're probably going to disagree in a, and, and what some people might consider slightly less civil than what I would be with a, a stranger, right? But it's because of our past history. But I, I think that that goes to, uh, it, it, it goes to the idea, though, about, uh, um, how civil and, and, and the way that we uh, the way that we uh, disagree with each other uh, because uh, in this situation we could be quite heated knowing that we both want in the end to see a, a participatory society right um, but if I come off like I did to you with somebody who that's not what they share, then I've lost, I've, I, I could have lost them, you know, for, for good, then they won't pay any more attention to me. Uh, and I, and I think that it's uh, important for me uh, and for everybody uh, to, to think about uh, how they're coming off. Uh, and then when they're pushed back on to not get defensive and to really take seriously what people's uh, reactions are even if we don't agree with those reactions, it doesn't matter because uh, sometimes your intentions don't translate in, into the same consequences. So if somebody hears that that, uh, that I said that Michael was fucking crazy, right? Well, th that matters, right? And so anyway, I just kind of wanted to bring that up that, uh, uh, that uh, it, we do need to think a lot about uh, how we come off in these types of discussions and, and, uh, and whether it's, you know, whether it's I, like, I also don't like to get into the idea of like, everything has to be civil, you know, the, the same way that uh, in politics, you end up losing because you can't get passionate enough or aggressive enough. Right. Um, but uh, anyway, I just want to throw that in, but I think it's an important thing for us to, to consider as we're having these discussions that we want uh, in the end to push uh, the, the discussion forward in some way. Uh, and not just to come to some kind of uh, standstill. Of course, I agree with you. But I think what you're describing is a necessary and valuable personal solution, call it, or personal attempt at mitigating the, the problem. And what I was trying to do, actually, because so it's right with what you're raising, what I was trying to do with this... Um, 
scaffold edge or uh which is probably is a little bit ridiculous uh or, or necessary and contingent um as a as a framework was to try and find a more collective solution that's sort of cultural for example there is a community which in which people who don't know each other can get really can use words like that right that other people would consider uncivil and nobody in the community reacts as if it's uncivil and that's scientists right in, in other words in when physicists are arguing or biochemists are arguing or whatever it you know that's crazy is typical that is not an uncommon thing um and and even aggressively it's always about the idea right but when we do it politically it may be about the idea but it's taken to be about the person and it's taken to be uncivil and so on but for some reason in this other realm people can interact together can get passionate can use words that are let's call them derogatory except it's derogatory of the ideas and then walk off and have a beer no problem um but in the left big problem right and what i was trying to do was to maybe suggest that there was something lurking in what this whole discussion is about that could help with that not based on the humanity and the attentiveness of Lonnie and other individuals who take it upon themselves to be attuned to this, but by changing the culture of the left or the approach of the left so that the, so that passionate argument is possible and not a, a, a basis for hostility. Right. Um, well, the, the only, the only, uh, I guess the, what you're describing is, is wanting or you know the the want for a change of culture on the left and i guess my thing was not just on the left but in broader society as well uh, and yeah. that at that point it really is a matter of thinking strategically so again it doesn't matter what you intended it, you have to think more strategically because if somebody took it the wrong way that's, that could be the end of it, and and so it's not it's not about what I wanted to get across in, in that in those situations. Now, if you're talking about people who are already, uh, you know, in, in some type of a general agreement, like on the left, then uh, then then yeah, I, I I agree with you. I hope that we can get to that point. But I still, even in that case, I believe that it matters how people feel about the way that you're coming across, because uh, if they feel attacked then that matters. And like, it still matters yeah. one way or the other, you know, whether they're on the left or whether they're just Joe or Joe Lane off the street. Um, I don't disagree. I'm just trying to set up a situation where it is less likely that people will feel attacked. Right? Scientists don't feel attacked by that kind of exchange. That's actually, I mean, I'm accused of this kind of thing often, probably rightly. So is Noam. Noam has um, reams of people that's the wrong word. Um, you know, large numbers of people who love him. He also has a lot of people who hate him, right? Um, uh, who are in linguistic circles and so on um, because of the way he argues and because of the way he demolishes, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think any biologist has that attitude to him, but a lot of social scientists do. It, it's really sort of, interesting um i mean there's another reason why people hate him is because they feel sold out you know he's he's the the dean of a position lots of people are adopting that position and then all of a sudden he changes and they feel like it's a sellout i mean i know that maybe this is worth not worth doing but he he's a weird he's an unusual cookie there's chomsky one chomsky two chomsky three there's there's people attached to chomsky one chomsky two chomsky three not in the political realm but in the um linguistics uh social science you know cognitive science realm and and they feel attacked they're not but they feel it 
so you're right ronnie i mean uh, you know anyway maybe that was an aside that was of no use <laughs> um have we got more Is everybody washed out? Finished? Anybody got something Wait. they want to? What? I know, I just want to say it's getting late here. <laughs> oh, yeah, you guys are. What time is it? It's not so late. Nine, it's 9 30 in the evening. Ah, that's early. Too bad. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's how I get in trouble. Um, <laughs> Uh, all right. Bye, Marsha. Joe, you wanted to say something? Let's have more of these. <laughs> uh, so I know in your abundant spare time, Michael. <laughs> no, I have time. That's not a problem. And I'm having more time as time passes. I'll tell you a little something about getting old, which I am. Um, you watch a show on Sunday that you like. The following Sunday comes, you watch it again. Wait a minute, I watched that yesterday. There, it's there's time disappears. I don't know how to describe it, but it's just not there. Um, I'm pretty sure it's because you don't remember all the things that happen in the, in the week. And so the week seems like a day, something like that. Maybe this is just me, but I certainly experience it. Um, anyway, that wasn't part of today's session. <laughs> but thanks, I to just the wanted... thanks to mm -hmm. the organizers for this as well as Michael, but yeah, thank, thank you all for putting this on. Just wanted to say that if you have any one of you any suggestions, uh, if you want to talk about something, uh, just let us know the education and skills team, and we will try to arrange it. But I think next up uh, is uh, will be like a session with um, Peter on uh, uh, like uh, uh, culture, culture and uh, global justice.